Introduction to My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass, narrated by Greducator. When a man raises himself from the lowest condition in society to the highest, mankind pay him the tribute of their admiration. When he accomplishes this elevation by native energy, guided by prudence and wisdom, their admiration is increased. But when his course, onward and upward, excellent in itself, furthermore proves a possible, what had hitherto been regarded as an impossible, reform, then he becomes a burning and a shining light, on which the aged may look with gladness, the young with hope, and the downtrodden as a representative of what they may themselves become. To such a man, dear reader, it is my privilege to introduce you. The life of Frederick Douglass, recorded in the pages which follow, is not merely an example of self-elevation under the most adverse circumstances. It is, moreover, a noble vindication of the highest aims of the American anti-slavery movement. The real object of that movement is not only to disenthrall, it is also to bestow upon the Negro the exercise of all those rights from the possession of which he has been so long debarred. But this full recognition of the colored man to the right and the entire admission of the same to the full privileges, political, religious, and social, of manhood requires powerful effort on the part of the enthralled, as well as on the part of those who would disenthrall them. The people at large must feel the conviction, as well as admit the abstract logic of human equality. The Negro, for the first time in the world's history, brought in full contact with high civilization, must prove his title first to all that is demanded for him, in the teeth of unequal chances. He must prove himself equal to the mass of those who oppress him, therefore absolutely superior to his apparent fate, and to their relative ability. And it is most cheering to the friends of freedom today that evidence of this equality is rapidly accumulating, not from the ranks of the half-freed colored people of the free states, but from the very depths of slavery itself. The indestructible equality of man to man is demonstrated by the ease with which black men, scarce one remove from barbarism, if slavery can be honored with such a distinction, vault into the high places of the most advanced and painfully acquired civilization. Ward and Garnett, Wells, Brown, and Pennington, Logan and Douglas are banners on the outer wall under which abolition is fighting its most successful battles because they are living exemplars of the practicability of the most radical abolitionism. For they were all of them born to the doom of slavery, some of them remained slaves until adult age. Yet they all have not only one equality to their white fellow citizens in civil, religious, political, and social rank, but they have also illustrated and adorned our common country by their genius, learning, and eloquence. The characteristics whereby Mr. Douglas has won first rank among these remarkable men and is still rising toward highest rank among living Americans, are abundantly laid bare in the book before us. Like the autobiography of Hugh Miller, it carries us so far back into early childhood as to throw light upon the question when positive and persistent memory begins in the human being. And, like Hugh Miller, he must have been a shy, old-fashioned child, occasionally oppressed by what he could not well account for, peering and poking about among the layers of right and wrong, of tyrant and thrall, and the wonderfulness of that hopeless tide of things which brought power to one race and unrequited toil to another, until, finally, he stumbled upon his first-found Ammonite, hidden away down in the depths of his own nature, and which revealed to him the fact that liberty and right for all men were anterior to slavery and wrong. When his knowledge of the world was bounded by the visible horizon on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, and while everything around him bore a fixed iron stamp as if it had always been so, this was, 
for one so young, a notable discovery. To his uncommon memory, then, we must add a keen and accurate insight into men and things, an original breadth of common sense which enabled him to see and weigh and compare whatever passed before him, and which kindled a desire to search out and define their relations to other things not so patent, but which never succumbed to the marvelous nor the supernatural, a sacred thirst for liberty and for learning, first as a means of attaining liberty, then as an end in itself most desirable, a will, an unfaltering energy and determination to obtain what his soul pronounced desirable, a majestic selfhood, determined courage, a deep and agonizing sympathy with his imbruted, crushed, and bleeding fellow-slaves, and an extraordinary depth of passion, together with that rare alliance between passion and intellect, which enables the former, when deeply roused, to excite, develop, and sustain the latter. With these original gifts in view, let us look at his schooling, the fearful discipline through which it pleased God to prepare him for the high calling on which he has since entered, the advocacy of emancipation by the people who are not slaves, and for this special mission, his plantation education was better than any he could have acquired in any lettered school. What he needed was facts and experiences, welded to acutely wrought-up sympathies, and these he could not elsewhere have obtained, in a manner so peculiarly adapted to his nature. His physical being was well-trained, also, running wild until advanced into boyhood, hard work and light diet thereafter, and a skill in handicraft in youth. For his special mission, then, this was, considered in connection with his natural gifts, a good schooling, and, for his special mission, he doubtless left school just at the proper moment. Had he remained longer in slavery, had he fretted under bonds until the ripening of manhood and its passions, until the drear agony of slave wife and slave children had been piled upon his already bitter experiences, then not only would his own history have had another termination, but the drama of American slavery would have been essentially varied, for I cannot resist the belief that the boy who learned to read and write as he did, who taught his fellow slaves these precious acquirements as he did, who plotted for their mutual escape as he did, would, when a man at bay, strike a blow which would make slavery real and stagger. Furthermore, blows and insults he bore at the moment without resentment. Deep but suppressed emotion rendered him insensible to their sting, but it was afterward when the memory of them went seething through his brain, breeding a fiery indignation at his injured selfhood, that the resolve came to resist, and the time fixed when to resist, and the plot laid how to resist, and he always kept his self-pledged word. In what he undertook in this line, he looked fate in the face, and had a cool, keen look at the relation of means to ends. Henry Bibb, to avoid chastisement, strewed his master's bed with charmed leaves, and was whipped. Frederick Douglass, quietly pocketed a like fetish, compared his muscles with those of Covey, and whipped him. In the history of his life in bondage, we find, well developed, that inherent and continuous energy of character which will ever render him distinguished. What his hand found to do, he did with his might. Even while conscious that he was wronged out of his daily earnings, he worked, and worked hard. At his daily labor he went with a will, with keen, well-set eye, brawny chest, lithe figure, and fair sweep of arm. He would have been king among cockers had that been his mission. It must not be overlooked in this glance at his education that Mr. Douglas lacked one aid to which so many men of mark have been deeply indebted. He had neither a mother's care nor a mother's culture, save that which slavery grudgingly meted out to him. Bitter nurse, may not even her features relax with human feeling when she gazes at such offspring. 
how susceptible he was to the kindly influences of mother culture may be gathered from his own words on page 57. Quote, it has been a lifelong standing grief to me that I know so little of my mother and that I was so early separated from her. The counsels of her love must have been beneficial to me. The side view of her face is imaged on my memory, and I take few steps in life without feeling her presence. But the image is mute, and I have no striking words of hers treasured up. End quote. From the depths of chattel slavery in Maryland, our author escaped into the caste slavery of the North, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Here he found oppression assuming another and hardly less bitter form. Of that very handicraft which the greed of slavery had taught him, his half-freedom denied him the exercise for an honest living. He found himself one of a class, free-colored men, whose position he has described in the following words. Aliens are we in our native land. The fundamental principles of the Republic, to which the humblest white man, whether born here or elsewhere, may appeal with confidence in the hope of awakening a favorable response, are held to be inapplicable to us. The glorious doctrines of your revolutionary fathers and the more glorious teachings of the Son of God are construed and applied against us. We are literally scourged beyond the beneficent range of both authorities, human and divine. American humanity hates us, scorns us, disowns and denies in a thousand ways our very personality. The outspread wing of American Christianity, apparently broad enough to give shelter to a perishing world, refuses to cover us. To us, its bones are brass and its features iron. In running thither for shelter and succor, we have only fled from the hungry bloodhound to the devouring wolf, from a corrupt and selfish world to a hollow and hypocritical church. Speech before American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, May 1854. Four years or more from 1837 to 1841, he struggled on in New Bedford, sawing wood, rolling casks, or doing what labor he might, to support himself and young family. Four years he brooded over the scars which slavery and semi-slavery had inflicted upon his body and soul, and then, with his wounds yet unhealed, he fell among the Garrisonians, a glorious waif to those most ardent reformers. It happened one day at Nantucket that he, diffidently and reluctantly, was led to address an anti-slavery meeting. He was about the age when the younger Pitt entered the House of Commons. Like Pitt, too, he stood up a born orator. William Lloyd Garrison, who was happily present, writes thus of Mr. Douglas's maiden effort. I shall never forget his first speech at the convention. The extraordinary emotion it excited in my own mind, the powerful impression it created upon a crowded auditory completely taken by surprise. I think I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment. Certainly, my perception of the enormous outrage which is inflicted by it on the godlike nature of its victims was rendered far more clear than ever. There stood one in physical proportions and stature commanding and exact, in intellect richly endowed, in natural eloquence a prodigy. Footnote Letter, Introduction to Life of Frederick Douglass, Boston, 1841. It is of interest to compare Mr. Douglass's account of this meeting with Mr. Garrison's. Of the two, I think the latter the most correct. It must have been a grand burst of eloquence. The pent-up agony, indignation, and pathos of an abused and harrowed boyhood and youth bursting out in all their freshness and overwhelming earnestness. This unique introduction to its great leader led immediately to the employment of Mr. Douglas as an agent by the American Anti-Slavery Society. So far as his self-relying and independent character would permit, he became, after the strictest sect, a Garrisonian. It is not too much to say that he formed a complement which they needed, 
and they were a complement equally necessary to his makeup. With his deep and keen sensitiveness to wrong and his wonderful memory, he came from the land of bondage, full of its woes and its evils, and painting them in characters of living light, and on his part, he found, told out in sound Saxon phrase, all those principles of justice and right and liberty, which had dimly brooded over the dreams of his youth, seeking definite forms and verbal expression. It must have been an electric flashing of thought, and a knitting of soul, granted to but few in this life, and will be a lifelong memory to those who participated in it. In the society, moreover, of Wendell Phillips, Edmund Quincy, William Lloyd Garrison, and other men of earnest faith and refined culture, Mr. Douglas enjoyed the high advantage of their assistance and counsel in the labor of self-culture, to which he now addressed himself with wonted energy. Yet these gentlemen, although proud of Frederick Douglass, failed to fathom and bring out to the light of day the highest qualities of his mind. The force of their own education stood in their own way. They did not delve into the mind of a colored man for capacities which the pride of race led them to believe to be restricted to their own Saxon blood. Bitter and vindictive sarcasm, irresistible mimicry, and a pathetic narrative of his own experiences of slavery were the intellectual manifestations which they encouraged him to exhibit on the platform or in the lecture desk. A visit to England in 1845 threw Mr. Douglas among men and women of earnest souls and high culture, and who, moreover, had never drank of the bitter waters of American caste. For the first time in his life, he breathed an atmosphere congenial to the longings of his spirit and felt his manhood free and unrestricted. The cordial and manly greetings of the British and Irish audiences in public and the refinement and elegance of the social circles in which he mingled, not only as an equal, but as a recognized man of genius, were, doubtless, genial and pleasant resting places in his hitherto thorny and troubled journey through life. There are joys on the earth, and to the wayfaring fugitive from American slavery or American caste, this is one of them. But his sojourn in England was more than a joy to Mr. Douglas. Like the platform at Nantucket, it awakened him to the consciousness of new powers that lay in him. From the pupillage of garrisonism, he rose to the dignity of a teacher and a thinker, his opinions on the broader aspects of the great American question were earnestly and incessantly sought from various points of view, and he must perforce bestir himself to give suitable answer. With that prompt and truthful perception which has led their sisters in all ages of the world to gather at the feet and support the hands of reformers, the gentle women of England were foremost to encourage and strengthen him to carve out for himself a path fitted to his powers and energies in the life battle against slavery and caste to which he was pledged. Footnote 2. One of these ladies, impelled by the same noble spirit which carried Miss Nightingale to Scutari, has devoted her time, her untiring energies, to a great extent her means, and her high literary abilities, to the advancement and support of Frederick Douglass's paper, the only organ of the downtrodden, edited and published by one of themselves in the United States. And one stirring thought, inseparable from the British idea of the evangel of freedom, must have smote his ear from every side. Hereditary bondmen, know ye not, who would be free themselves must strike the blow? The result of this visit was that on his return to the United States, he established a newspaper, this proceeding was sorely against the wishes and the advice of the leaders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, but our author had fully grown up to the conviction of a truth which they had once promulged, but now forgotten, to wit, that in their own elevation, self-elevation, colored men have a blow to strike, on their own hook, against slavery and caste. Differing from his Boston friends in this matter, Diffident in his own abilities, reluctant at their dissuadings, how beautiful is the loyalty with which he still clung to their principles in all things else, 
and even in this. Now came the trial hour. Without cordial support from any large body of men or party on this side the Atlantic, and too far distant in space and immediate interest to expect much more after the much already done on the other side, he stood up almost alone to the arduous labor and heavy expenditure of editor and lecturer. The garrison party to which he still adhered did not want a colored newspaper. There was an odor of caste about it. The Liberty Party could hardly be expected to give warm support to a man who smote their principles as with a hammer, and the wide gulf which separated the free-colored people from the Garrisonians also separated them from their brother, Frederick Douglass. The arduous nature of his labors, from the date of the establishment of his paper, may be estimated by the fact that anti-slavery papers in the United States even while organs of, and when supported by, anti-slavery parties, have, with a single exception, failed to pay expenses. Mr. Douglas has maintained, and does maintain, his paper without the support of any party, and even in the teeth of the opposition of those from whom he had reason to expect counsel and encouragement. He has been compelled, at one and the same time, and almost constantly, during the past seven years, to contribute matter to its columns as editor and to raise funds for its support as lecturer. It is within bounds to say that he has expended $12,000 of his own hard-earned money in publishing this paper, a larger sum than has been contributed by any one individual for the general advancement of the colored people. There had been many other papers published and edited by colored men, beginning as far back as 1827, when the Rev. Samuel E. Cornish and John B. Russworm, a graduate of Bowdoin College and afterward governor of Cape Palmas, published the Freedom's Journal in New York City. Probably not less than 100 newspaper enterprises have been started in the United States by free colored men, born free, and some of them of liberal education and fair talents for this work, but one after another they have fallen through, although in several instances anti-slavery friends contributed to their support. Footnote 3. Mr. Stephen Myers of Albany deserves mention as one of the most persevering among the colored editorial fraternity. It had almost been given up as an impracticable thing to maintain a colored newspaper when Mr. Douglas with fewest early advantages of all his competitors, essayed, and has proved the thing perfectly practicable, and moreover of great public benefit. This paper, in addition to its power in holding up the hands of those to whom it is especially devoted, also affords irrefutable evidence of the justice, safety, and practicability of immediate emancipation. It further proves the immense loss which slavery inflicts on the land while it dooms such energies as his to the hereditary degradation of slavery. It has been said in this introduction that Mr. Douglas had raised himself by his own efforts to the highest position in society. As a successful editor in our land, he occupies this position. Our editors rule the land, and he is one of them. As an orator and thinker, his position is equally high in the opinion of his countrymen. If a stranger in the United States would seek its most distinguished men, the movers of public opinion, he will find their names mentioned and their movements chronicled under the head of By Magnetic Telegraph in the daily papers. The keen caterers for the public attention set down in this column such men only as have won high mark in the public esteem. During the past winter, 1854-5, to five, very frequent mention of Frederick Douglass was made under this head in the daily papers. His name glided as often, this week from Chicago, next week from Boston, over the lightning wires as the name of any other man, of whatever note. To no man did the people more widely nor more earnestly say, Tell me thy thought. And, somehow or other, revolution seemed to follow in his wake. His were not the mere words of eloquence which Koshuth speaks of that delight the ear and then pass away. No, 
They were workable, doable words that brought forth fruits in the revolution in Illinois and in the passage of the franchise resolutions by the Assembly of New York. And the secret of his power? What is it? He is a representative American man, a type of his countrymen. Naturalists tell us that a full-grown man is a resultant or representative of all animated nature on this globe, beginning with the early embryo state, then representing the lowest forms of organic life and passing through every subordinate grade or type until he reaches the last and highest, manhood. Footnote 4. The German physiologists have even discovered vegetable matter, starch, in the human body. See Medico Chirurgical Review, October 1854, page 339. In like manner and to the fullest extent, has Frederick Douglass passed through every gradation of rank comprised in our national makeup and bears upon his person and upon his soul everything that is American. And he has not only full sympathy with everything American, his proclivity or bent to active toil and visible progress are in the strictly national direction, delighting to outstrip all creation. Nor have the natural gifts, already named as his, lost anything by his severe training. When unexcited, his mental processes are probably slow, but singularly clear in perception and wide in vision, the unfailing memory bringing up all the facts in their every aspect— incongruities he lays hold of incontinently and holds up on the edge of his keen and telling wit. But this wit never descends to frivolity. It is rigidly in the keeping of his truthful common sense and always used in illustration or proof of some point which could not so readily be reached any other way. Quote, Beware of a Yankee when he is feeding, end quote is a shaft that strikes home in a matter never so laid bare by satire before. Quote, the Garrisonian views of disunion, if carried to a successful issue, would only place the people of the North in the same relation to American slavery which they now bear to the slavery of Cuba or the Brazils, end quote, is a statement, in a few words, which contains the result and the evidence of an argument which might cover pages, but could not carry stronger conviction, nor be stated in less pregnable form. In proof of this, I may say that having been submitted to the attention of the Garrisonians in print in March, it was repeated before them at their business meeting in May, the platform par excellence on which they invite free fight, a l'outrance, to all comers. It was given out in the clear, ringing tones wherewith the Hall of Shields was wont to resound of old. Yet neither Garrison, nor Phillips, nor May, nor Remond, nor Foster, nor Burley, with his subtle steel of the icebrook's temper, ventured to break a lance upon it. The doctrine of the dissolution of the Union, as a means for the abolition of American slavery, was silenced upon the lips that gave it birth and in the presence of an array of defenders who compose the keenest intellects in the land. Quote, the man who is right is a majority, end quote, is an aphorism struck out by Mr. Douglas in that great gathering of the Friends of Freedom at Pittsburgh in 1852, where he towered among the highest, because, with abilities inferior to none, and moved more deeply than any, there was neither policy nor party to trammel the outpourings of his soul. Thus we find, opposed to all disadvantages which a black man in the United States labors and struggles under, is this one vantage ground. When the chance comes, and the audience where he may have a say, he stands forth the freest, most deeply moved, and most earnest of all men. It has been said of Mr. Douglas that his descriptive and declamatory powers, admitted to be of the very highest order, take precedence of his logical force. Whilst the schools might have trained him to the exhibition of the formulas of deductive logic, nature and circumstances forced him into the exercise of the higher faculties required by induction. The first ninety pages of this Life in Bondage afford specimens of observing, 
comparing and careful classifying of such superior character that it is difficult to believe them the results of a child's thinking. He questions the earth and the children and the slaves around him again and again, and finally looks to God in the sky for the why and wherefore of the unnatural thing, slavery. Yes, if indeed thou art, wherefore dost thou suffer us to be slain? is the only prayer and worship of the God-forsaken dodos in the heart of Africa. Almost the same was his prayer. One of his earliest observations was that white children should know their ages, while the color children were ignorant of theirs, and the songs of the slaves grated on his inmost soul, because a something told him that harmony in sound and music of the spirit could not consociate with miserable degradation. To such a mind, the ordinary processes of logical deduction are like proving that two and two make four. Mastering the intermediate steps by an intuitive glance, or recurring to them as Ferguson resorted to geometry, it goes down to the deeper relation of things, and brings out what may seem, to some, mere statements, but which are new and brilliant generalizations, each resting on a broad and stable basis, Thus, Chief Justice Marshall gave his decisions, and then told Brother Story to look up the authorities, and they never differed from him. Thus, also, in his Lecture on the Anti-Slavery Movement, delivered before the Rochester Ladies' Anti-Slavery Society, Mr. Douglas presents a mass of thought which, without any showy display of logic on his part, requires an exercise of the reasoning faculties of the reader to keep pace with him, and his claims of the Negro ethnologically considered is full of new and fresh thoughts on the dawning science of race history. If, as has been stated, his intellection is slow when unexcited, it is most prompt and rapid when he is thoroughly aroused. Memory, logic, wit, sarcasm, invective, pathos, and bold imagery of rare structural beauty, well up as from a copious fountain, yet each in its proper place, and contributing to form a whole, grand in itself, yet complete in the minutest proportions. It is most difficult to hedge him in a corner, for his positions are taken so deliberately that it is rare to find a point in them undefended aforethought. Professor Reason tells me the following, quote, On a recent visit of a public nature to Philadelphia, and in a meeting composed mostly of his colored brethren, Mr. Douglas proposed a comparison of views in the matters of the relations and duties of our people, he holding that prejudice was the result of condition and could be conquered by the efforts of the degraded themselves. A gentleman present distinguished for logical acumen and subtlety, and who had devoted no small portion of the last twenty-five years to the study and elucidation of this very question, held the opposite view, that prejudice is innate and unconquerable. He terminated a series of well-dovetailed Socratic questions to Mr. Douglas with the following— if the legislature at Harrisburg should awaken tomorrow morning and find each man's skin turn black and his hair woolly, what could they do to remove prejudice? Immediately pass laws entitling black men to all civil, political, and social privileges, was the instant reply, and the questioning ceased. End quote. The most remarkable mental phenomenon in Mr. Douglas is his style in writing and speaking. In March 1855, he delivered an address in the assembly chamber before the members of the legislature of the state of New York. An eyewitness describes the crowded and most intelligent audience and their rapt attention to the speaker as the grandest scene he ever witnessed in the capital. Footnote 5. Mr. William H. Topp of Albany. Among those whose eyes were riveted on the speaker full two hours and a half were Thurlow Weed and Lieutenant Governor Raymond, the latter, at the conclusion of the address, exclaimed to a friend, I would give $20,000 if I could deliver that address in that manner. Mr. Raymond is a first-class graduate of Dartmouth, a rising politician, ranking foremost in the legislature, 
of course, his ideal of oratory must be of the most polished and finished description. The style of Mr. Douglas in writing is to me an intellectual puzzle. The strength, affluence, and terseness may easily be accounted for, because the style of a man is the man. But how are we to account for that rare polish in his style of writing, which, most critically examined, seems the result of careful early culture among the best classics of our language? It equals, if it does not surpass the style of Hugh Miller, which was the wonder of the British literary public, until he unraveled the mystery in the most interesting of autobiographies, but Frederick Douglass was still cocking the seams of Baltimore clippers and had only written a pass at the age when Miller's style was already formed. I asked William Whipper of Pennsylvania, the gentleman alluded to above, whether he thought Mr. Douglass's power inherited from the Negroid or from what is called the Caucasian side of his makeup. After some reflection, he frankly answered, I must admit, although sorry to do so, that the Caucasian predominates. At that time I almost agreed with him, but facts narrated in the first part of this work throw a different light on this interesting question. We are left in the dark as to who was the paternal ancestor of our author, a fact which generally holds good of the Romuluses and Remuses who are to inaugurate the new birth of our republic. In the absence of testimony from the Caucasian side, we must see what evidence is given on the other side of the house. Quote, My grandmother, though advanced in years, was yet a woman of power and spirit. She was marvelously straight in figure, elastic and muscular. End quote. Page 46. After describing her skill in constructing nets, her perseverance in using them, and her widespread fame in the agricultural way, he adds... It happened to her, as it will happen to any careful and thrifty person residing in an ignorant and improvident neighborhood, to enjoy the reputation of being born to good luck. And his grandmother was a black woman. Quote, My mother was tall and finely proportioned, of deep, black, glossy complexion, had regular features, and among other slaves was remarkably sedate in her manners. Quote, being a field hand, she was obliged to walk twelve miles and return between nightfall and daybreak to see her children. Page 54. Quote, I shall never forget the indescribable expression of her countenance when I told her that I had had no food since morning. There was pity in her glance at me and a fiery indignation at Aunt Katie at the same time. She read Aunt Katie a lecture which she never forgot page 56. Quote, I learned after my mother's death that she could read and that she was the only one of all the slaves and colored people in Tuckahoe who enjoyed that advantage. How she acquired this knowledge, I know not, for Tuckahoe is the last place in the world where she would be apt to find facilities for learning. Page 57. Quote, there is, in Pritchard's Natural History of Man, the head of a figure on page 157, the features of which so resemble those of my mother that I often recur to it with something of the feeling which I suppose others experience when looking upon the pictures of dear departed ones. Page 52. The head alluded to is copied from the statue of Ramses the Great, an Egyptian king of the 19th dynasty. The authors of the Types of Mankind give a side view of the same on page 148, remarking that the profile, quote, like Napoleon's, is superbly European. The nearness of its resemblance to Mr. Douglas's mother rests upon the evidence of his memory, and judging from his almost marvelous feats of recollection of forms and outlines recorded in this book, this testimony may be admitted. These facts show that for his energy, perseverance, eloquence, invective, sagacity, and wide sympathy, he is indebted to his Negro blood. The very marvel of his style would seem to be a development of that other marvel, how his mother learned to read. The versatility of talent which he wields 
in common with Dumas, Ira Aldridge, and Miss Greenfield, would seem to be the result of the grafting of the Anglo-Saxon on good, original, negro stock. If the friends of Caucasus choose to claim, for that region, what remains after this analysis, to wit, combination, they are welcome to it. They will forgive me for reminding them that the term Caucasian is dropped by recent writers on ethnology, for the people about Mount Caucasus are, and have ever been, Mongols. The great white race now seek paternity, according to Dr. Pickering, in Arabia, Arido Nutrix, of the best breed of horses, etc. Keep on, gentlemen, you will find yourselves in Africa by and by. The Egyptians, like the Americans, were a mixed race, with some Negro blood circling around the throne, as well as in the mud hovels. This is the proper place to remark of our author, that the same strong selfhood which led him to measure strength with Mr. Covey and to wrench himself from the embrace of the Garrisonians, and which has borne him through many resistances to the personal indignities offered him as a colored man, sometimes becomes a hypersensitiveness to such assaults as men of his mark will meet with on paper. Keen and unscrupulous opponents have sought, and not unsuccessfully, to pierce him in this direction, for well they know that if assailed, he will smite back. It is not without a feeling of pride, dear reader, that I present you with this book. The son of a self-emancipated bondwoman, I feel joy in introducing to you my brother, who has rent his own bonds, and who, in his every relation, as a public man, as a husband, and as a father, is such as does honor to the land which gave him birth. I shall place this book in the hands of the only child spared me, bidding him to strive and emulate its noble example. You may do likewise. It is an American book, for Americans, in the fullest sense of the idea. It shows that the worst of our institutions, in its worst aspect, cannot keep down energy, truthfulness, and earnest struggle for the right. It proves the justice and practicability of immediate emancipation. It shows that any man in our land, quote, no matter in what battle his liberty may have been cloven down, no matter what complexion an Indian or an African son may have burned upon him, end quote, not only may, quote, stand forth redeemed and disenthralled, end quote, but may also stand up a candidate for the highest suffrage of a great people, the tribute of their honest, Hearty admiration. Reader, Wale, New York, James McCune Smith.